my name is Alanis King and this right here is a 2021 Factory 5 Type 65 Coupe R. It has a 5.2 liter Ford Racing V8, a 6 speed manual transmission, it's a Tremec T56, and about 600 horsepower. This car is meant to replicate the Shelby Daytona Coupe that won the GT class of the World Manufacturers Championship in 1965 but with modern technology. It was professionally built by the shop I'm in right now, Fulbright Motorsports, and it's a testament to how customizable and captivating kit cars can be, and I cannot wait to show it to you today. But first, if you like racing history and modern technology, this car is now available on cars and bids. It's being sold by Ganau Auto Works, and it's live right now if you want to check out more photos see the full spec list and all the customizations or maybe even bid on it you can check out the link in the description of this video this car began as factory 5's type 65 coupe r which is a kit designed for professional competition the kit doesn't come with an engine transmission wheels tires or a paint job so that's up to buyers to choose and add and the assembly manual for this kit is more than 200 pages long, so it's pretty complicated. I'm going to have the person who built this car, Tommy Fulbright, walk you through all the specs and details and customizations in a second, but we're gonna start with the basics. This Factory 5 kit has a full cage and its chassis is legal in SCCA and NASA wheel-to-wheel -wheel competition. It has race seats with five-point harnesses and those seats are compatible with Hans devices to protect your head and neck in a crash. This car has an air jack system and a ridiculous rear wing. The steering wheel comes off like a true race car and these two buttons up here allow safety workers to kill the battery and operate the fire suppression system if you have an issue on track. It also has some normal car comforts, if you could call them that, like a suede headliner, touchscreen navigation, and a headphone intercom system, so you could actually hear your passengers over these ripping side exhausts. Some other cool features of this car include all the little aero bits. So we have these front winglets right here. We have holes around the side of the car to direct air. We also have this giant hole in the hood to extract heat so things don't get too toasty. You'll notice we also have indicators up here because if we're driving legally in the street, we also need to be using our blinkers. Now I read the comments and I know that anytime I drive a car, y'all need me to get in the trunk. This car technically does have a rear hatch, but since it's a really fancy, nice race car, I'm not really supposed to get in there. In order to make you happy, to give you something, I figured I would try to limbo under the rear wing. I'm not very flexible, so this probably isn't gonna go very well, but let's see, let's see. Ready, ready? I think I did it. There you go. So I walked you through the basics of this car, but I think the right person to tell you about all the customizations is the person who built it, Tommy Fulbright. Hi, I'm Tommy. Give me an idea of what we're looking at here. Just walk me around the car. <sighs> all right, I'll give you, uh, I'm sure she covered some of the basics in this car. Uh, I'll go ahead and start at the front and I will work my way towards the back. This has the, uh, the R car aerodynamics package on there, which is suitable for track type stuff. That's exactly what this car was built for and yet still has the ability to be streetable. The headlights are actually JW speaker headlights. That's an LED style headlight that we wanted to use for uh, or a number of reasons for that modern look, as well as the ability to see. We all know that old school seven inch halogen headlights are terrible. So these LEDs are incredibly bright. When you put on your high beams, most of your high beams will deactivate the low beams. And these actually maintain the low beams at the same time. So you're running not only high beams and low beams, you're getting that real nice penetration of light. So you don't overdrive your lights. And you have indicators up here, right? We, we have do. These, we have these orange Absolutely. indicators. Absolutely. The original cars had the uh, turn signal in indicators located inside the headlight buckets. And so uh, we did that as well just to, to, to match up with the original uh, Daytonas. It does have a chin spooler, adjustable chin spooler as well as the dive plane canards. This was one of the first cars that I ever drove that had true aero package on it. And this thing literally slices through the air. It, it goes wherever you want it to. You point and shoot and it tracks amazing. It's one of the easiest cars to drive. It's got a perfect 50-50 weight balance. Uh, we scaled it and managed to get that perfect balance of weight on all four corners. So the, it's incredibly predictable. It's an incredibly easy car to drive fast and it goes fast very easy. 
And when cars go fast, they get really hot. But you'll notice we got holes everywhere. We got holes here. We got holes here. We got holes on the sides. Tell me about all these. Not a problem. Not a problem. Uh, the biggest hole you see right here in the hood is actually the excavate for the radiator. And, uh, and taking advantage of that space that we have here, I also installed a power steering cooler as well as a engine oil cooler. But it does have a, the dry sump system in there, which I'll get to here in a minute. Every fluid on this car is cooled. Uh, the, it, it was originally built to run open road racing, which is like the Big Bend and the Silver State, those those kind of cars where you're running at top speed for sustained amounts of time. We would do anywhere between 59 to 90 miles in a session and you're doing that at full song as long as you can so the, it's critical to maintain uh, the cooling of all those critical components and in doing so like I said we have the power steering cooler the engine oil cooler a Ron Davis custom built radiator with dual electric fans it's got transmission coolers a differential cooler uh, it's got coolers for your helmets because it gets Love hot that. inside of race cars. I wanted to have adjustability was key on this car and, and quick adjustability. Uh, it has the Ritec dual adjustable coilovers with remote reservoirs. You can actually adjust compression, rebound, high speed, low speed, all right here just by reaching in and doing a couple clicks right here without having to do anything to the car as far as raise it up, open the hood, nothing. It's all adjustable right then and there. Same for the rears. You can access the rears without having to do anything to the car. So you come into the pits, just run a little stiff, run a little soft, whatever you want to do. You make some quick adjustments, get you back out there, no problem. And so we talk about quick adjustments, but we're running long periods of time here. You said we're running like 90 mile stints at a time. And Absolutely. You, you said that actually impacted the gearing. It did, it did. We were trying to go to the unlimited class. The unlimited class runs speeds over 200 miles an hour. Woo. So I reached out to my rep at Tremec and said, hey, I need a six speed package that will accommodate this for us. Told them what we were doing. And we have what they call their GT gearing in there, which they use in all their uh, touring car race cars. And so it's got a, a pretty tall gearing. Uh, point of reference, this engine redlines at 8,000 RPMs. I've had it in fourth gear at 4,000 RPMs, and I was about 157 miles an hour on a track. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> and if you just saw Trigger walk by, Trigger actually built this He car, did. He's, so. Most of the input is from him. Yeah, I mean, Tommy didn't really do anything here. Tommy's just the messenger. But, yeah, I mean, walk me around some of the other things here. We've got these side exhausts. Is it is it Viper territory here? If I'm stepping out of this car, do I have to be careful? Uh, is, is that, absolutely, absolutely <laughs> got to be careful getting out of this car. And, and that is one of the, the iconic features of the Daytona itself is the dual side pipes, and we had to stay with it. And the polished stainless, it, it started off as a nice silver stainless. Now it's getting a nice gold and purple hue to it. It's beautiful. I think that's one of the classic looks of this car as well as the... The rear end, in my opinion, there's not a sexier rear end in any in any car. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the rear end, and we will move back there later. But this wing is not the only option for the correct, rear end. Correct, correct. So w along with the aero package, with the side vents, the the front canards, the splitter, and the rear rear wing, that it's all you can remove it. Uh, with the exception of the side vents on the, the the car itself, you can remove the front nose and the rear wing and go back to the original look. We have the duck bill spoiler that goes in the rear, and removing that, you have the that classic look of the '65 Daytona, which really made this thing the icon that it is. And that will be included with the car. Absolutely, correct? amazing. As well as additional tire package for track package, and then we have some a couple of extra spares to go with it. Oh, I love that. So when we talk about kit cars, they come as a kit. What do you do to further that kit? Tell me all the extra stuff here that doesn't come in the original kit. So when we got the car from Factory 5, we wanted to upgrade it to the, the standards needed to run these, these open road races. Uh, one thing we wanted to do is bring this car up into the modern technology. So what we did is we used a, a PDM, a power distribution module, which is offered by Race Pack, and it's called their Smart Wire Package. There's not a single fuse or relay on this car. Everything's all solid state. And not only is the the Holly Dominator ECU laptop programmable, so is the entire chassis harness on this car. If you want the headlights to dim 30 seconds after you walk away, like your modern day car, we can do that. Ooh. You know, all of that stuff is programmable. It's got the race pack dash. This little red dot you see right here is actually a GPS antenna. Uh, we needed something to be incredibly accurate because when we're doing these open road races, you're racing the clock essentially, and it gets down to hundreds of, of a second that are, get that accurate to determine who wins and who loses. So this is actually a GPS antenna intended for aircraft, and it's uh, accurate up to about 2,000 miles an hour, which we're not getting anywhere near that. As much as I would like to, we're not. And it, it's incredibly accurate, and it really helped us maintain that ability to, to be consistent in times and stuff like that. So that GPS antenna, it works very, very fast, and also you have your little touchscreen navigation Absolutely. So here. it does have a, a, an 
iPad in here and the iPad actually has two different types of software on it. One is Vantage, which is another, it's a uh, data acquisition, acquisition system offered by Racepack to coincide with all the electronics we have on the car. So it will keep track of lap times. It can keep track of, uh, of uh, all your inputs and it piggybacks off the engine ECU. So it picks up all the parameters of the engine. So when you go back after a track day, you can pull up your track map and you can see like, oh, this is where my braking zone was. This is where I was on throttle. This is where I was off throttle. And it really helps you dial in those track times. Oh, Another so cool. advantage that running the Big Bend Open Road Race is you have a co-driver with you and his responsibility is to make sure that you're on those times. And in order to do so, we have a software called LeadNav. Uh, LeadNav was something that's been used by not only the military, but Baja 500, Baja 1000 trucks. And when you're out there running that fast, you have to have something very accurate as far as your waypoints, your turns, and all that stuff. And that was the benefit of running this lead nav software is that the co-driver prior to the race can go in there and set all, all your, your cues or turns or whatever you, however you want to set up. And then you get a hot little voice in your headset that says, hey, you got a turn coming up pretty soon. You might want to get ready. And so that really allevi alleviates the co-driver's responsibility from maintaining navigation to where he can actually focus on the engine parameters. And, and that was another benefit of running the Vantage on that. He can view everything that the engine's doing, which frees up the driver's ability to focus on the road, which when we're running speeds of 180, 190, 200 plus, that's really beneficial. And you don't just have a headset to talk to your co-driver. If you drive this on the street, which you could drive this to work if you want. Absolutely. It's loud and it you is need loud. the headsets to kind of talk to each and other. And that, right? that was another thing that uh, we, we stole from the, the, the off-road guys is the rugged radio system. Partially because of the, loud, the exhaust on the side, but also because communications is paramount when you're riding co-driver, co-driver setup. The rugged radio is, is Bluetooth as well. So not only can you pair your phone to it and listen to whatever you want to listen to, you can make phone calls. And so it's kind of got that little, that modern twist uh, of the amenities of today's current cars with the touch screen and all the electronics and everything like that really brings this car into the 21st century. So you can talk to people on the phone if you want in these headsets. Absolutely, yeah. So wow. It's pretty cool. You can call somebody and be like, hey, I'm in a race car. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. It, it is, it is. Uh, and along with the rugged radio stuff, I, I use their their helmet cooling system. It's got a blower system set up in there for when you're when you're running. Uh, this thing doesn't have AC, but it does have a helmet blower system, which is nice. Uh, you can put it, plug it into your helmet. And whenever I'm not wearing a helmet, I put it in my pocket that or put it underneath my shirt and there's a nice little air, little air circulation you got going on. So there's two things that you'll notice when you're looking in the back glass of this car. There's two different tanks, a red tank and a black tank. The red tank on this car is actually for the Lifeline fire suppression system, which is a automatic fire suppression system and it also has push button activation, which is, has six nozzles in this car. There's one above the fuel cell, there's three inside the driver's compartment, and then there's two inside of the engine compartment. So when you smash the button on a fire, it will cover the en entire car, both front to rear. It is the, the newest style foam. It's not Halon. It's uh, the newest style, and it, it's, it leaves no residue. It's clear, so if it does go off, say in the, you're in the pit somewhere and it goes off, you can actually clean it off, get back out there and go. That's, wow. that's, that's pretty freaking cool. So we have the two exterior buttons for the electrical and the fire. Correct. If you're in the car and somebody tells you the car is on fire, do you have a button in the Absolutely. car? Absolutely. You got the same identical buttons inside the car okay. that are both reachable for co-driver and driver in the event that something goes south and one of y'all aren't awake. You mm -hmm. can still smash a button and get everything out. And the buttons on the outside are generally intended for the safety workers at the racetrack. So the safety workers will zoom out to your car to correct. attend to you and they will smack those buttons. Yes, ma'am. That is mm -hmm. absolutely correct. <laughs> it's easily to deactivate. So say you got this thing at a car show and you got some grubby little five-year-old who wants like smashing buttons. He can oh, smash no. them all day and it's not going to activate the system. Not until you're ready to go to the track. You can plug it in and you're good to go. Oh, perfect. So you can play like Try Me Toys. Absolutely. The store. And exactly. nothing will and happen. Nothing will happen. <laughs> yeah, the, all, all they're doing is turning your battery off. Oh, wow. Thank goodness. And then the black tank that's back here is actually for the air jack system. I'm not sure if some of y'all are familiar with air jacks, but in 1965, Shelby was the first person to use air jacks in a competition setting. Knowing that, I kind of wanted to pay homage, give them a little hat tip in doing that. And so this car has air jacks as well. Air jacks are very cool. They're used often in sports car racing. They're used at Le Mans today. And it was really interesting. I was at Le Mans a couple of months ago and the NASCAR team was there and everybody told them to use the floor jack because right. they thought it looked cool <laughs> instead of the air jacks. But basically what happens with air jacks is the air just 
bumps the car off yeah, the ground. Yeah, it's, it, awesome. it's really pretty easy. wild to see the car just lift up, up by itself. Um, and <laughs> most of the times when you have an air jack system, you have to have a standalone tank, you know, that's set up in the pits. And we wanted to have the ability to show the car off at car shows. And so that's why we have the, the portable power tank in the back that allows us to hit those pressures needed to operate the air jacks. That is so cool. Okay, is there anything else back here that you want to walk me through before we move to the engine? The forge line wheels, I'm not sure if those were touched on. They're, they are a pin drive setup, so it's a single nut setup, which again speeds up pit stops, but also another hat tip to the original car because it had the knockoffs that you had to smash with a hammer. These, no hammer needed, just a really big socket. Oh, love that. And we have our exposed carbon wing back here. Yeah. And it just looks really, really nice. It is. It's really nice and it's really functional. It looks great. It's, is it wider than the car? If we were to measure the car, is it wider than the widest part of the car? Absolutely. Ah, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Imagine having a wing wider than your car. And I think it's a little bit above the roof line as well. So it's really catching that air that's coming wow. over the top of the car and redirecting it the way it should. Wow, incredible. Okay, so that's all back here and we move to the engine bay? Yep, let's do it. Sweet, let's do it. So as you can see, this is the 5.2 Illuminator engine, crate engine from Ford. Uh, out of the box comes with 580 horsepower. What we did was we added the Borla ITB fuel injection on it as well as the Aviate four-stage dry sump. Uh, reason being is it's a race car. Uh, race cars have higher G loads than most other cars, and so you really gotta maintain that oil, oiling capabilities. Uh, dry sump was the way to go. This is the tank, it's got a two and a half gallon tank mounted up front, I and mean, this is the actual catch can for the coolant system. A lot of this stuff was actually made in house, uh, specifically the, the catch can or, or the recirc tank for the, the coolant system. So the, the modern modular engines are, are all electric power steering. <laughs> uh, that is, and so what we had to do, we reached out to KRC. KRC has a setup that converts it to a actual belt driven power steering system as opposed to the electric setup. So we have that conversion on here as well. And it was really gives a nice feel on this car. Granted, she's super light and you could have done a manual rack, but it's easy to drive. It, it's really easy to drive. Oh, that's great. <laughs> the, the engine itself is actually controlled by Holly Dominator. Uh, you can get in there and change anything and everything you wanted. If you wanted to throw twin turbos on this thing, if you want to put a supercharger on it, you don't have to change any of the computer parameters other than plug your laptop in it and make the adjustments necessary. Lots of gold it. film. Uh, Lots of gold film here. Yes, it's uh, really nice. It looks pretty. Remi it reminds you a lot of the Lunar Lander, uh, yeah. which is back in the 60s. They were into that kind of stuff, but it is functional. This thing does generate a lot of heat. And so one of the biggest things we want to do is mitigate that heat and make it as comfortable as possible for the, the occupants. And so gold foil everywhere and it looks really cool. Oh, it does look cool. Yeah. I think the blue and the gold, like it really pops, especially on the white car. You know, it's one of those things you're like, Ooh, that looks good. Blue and yeah. gold is very Subaru vibes. We also have like the red logo. Absolutely. You know, like, yeah. Very WRX vibes going on in here. This is super cool. This hood is massive. It's so funny to see it. It, it really is. And then when you open it for the first time, most people don't realize how it opens, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's really cool. Uh, we finished it with the uh, lizard skin all, all on the underside to help mitigate some of the heat mm -hmm. as well as some of the noise. The entire car has Dynamat front, front to rear all the way. I know race car, most people don't care about it, but we wanted to make it as comfortable as possible when mm -hmm. you're driving this thing. And so that was one of the goals of it. So as you can see here, steering wheel has got a multitude of buttons on it. And these are actually your turn signals, your hazard and your horn. Uh, wow, so okay. being a being a, a race car steering column, there was no provisions for turn signals. So I made them, and it, it actually turns out pretty cool. It looks very race car. Everybody thinks it's for something other than what it is, but it's just your turn signals and your horn hazards. Can you honk? You got your horn. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! There goes Trigger. He's back. So one of the things that makes this car different than some of the other coupes from Factory Five is I actually dropped the floor pans, both driver and passenger side, to get you that that fist worth of clearance that you need from your helmet to roll bar. My co-driver in this car was six foot four, and so it was very tight for him at that time. So we dropped the floors an additional inch and a half, just where the seat mounts are. That way, it's easier to egress and get in and out of this car. And another thing we did is a. Uh, these cars come from Factory 5 with multiple mounting locations for the suspension, either a street height or a track height. And we wanted to set it at the track height and let it go. But one thing I didn't like about it is the front control arm mount, upper control arm mount was a single shear bracket in the race setting. So what I did is I added additional mount to it and created a double shear bracket on there to maintain that integrity. 
So one thing I wanted to mention uh, on the front end of this car is the, the air jacks are necessary to open the hood only when you have the aero package on. Uh, when you have the, the chin spoiler and all of that, that front air dam on the car, you do need to have those air jacks in order to open the hood. However, when you're doing in the, the stock setup with the, the standard look, no air dam in the front, the duck bill wing in the back, you don't need the air jacks to open the hood. I just wanted to mention that before. Before we drive this car, I think it's important to talk about why it even exists as a kit. By now, you know Ford versus Ferrari. It's a reoccurring thing where Ford decides it wants to beat Ferrari in road racing, shows up, beats Ferrari, then the whole thing becomes a legend. This car is modeled after one of those legends, the 1965 Shelby Daytona Coupe. The original Shelby Daytona Coupe came from Carroll Shelby's shop, and it was based on Shelby's Cobra 289 Roadster at the time. Only six of them were built, and the original ended up in a storage unit for 30 years, leading a lot of people to think it was lost for good. The Shelby Daytona Coupe has a deep and interesting history, and there's a full write-up in Road & Track about it if you're interested. But basically, it became the first American car to win the International Manufacturer's GT Championship, making it an iconic vehicle with an iconic look. That's why replicas like this exist. So only three people have ever driven this car, including Tommy, who built it. And if you decide to buy it, we're gonna keep that stat. You can be number Four, because Tommy's gonna take me around in this today. He knows the car very well. He can show us exactly what it can do. It's gonna be super cool. And I'll be in the passenger seat talking through what it feels like, what I feel like in the passenger seat, what's going on. And hopefully we'll give you a really good look at what it means to take a kit car to the extreme. the 2021 Factory 5 Type 65 Coupe R. It is a marvel of a car and it is street legal. That means if you want to take it to the racetrack, you don't have to trailer it there, which I feel like is everybody's dream. If you think this car is as cool as I do and you want to learn more about it, it is now for sale on Cars and Bids. You can check out more photos, See the full spec list or maybe even bid on it at the link in the description of this video. Otherwise, we'll see you next time.